Hi everybody, in this video I want to work through an idealized projectile motion problem in which a ball has been launched from a height of 1.5 meters above the level ground with a launch velocity of magnitude 15 meters per second in a direction 50 degrees above the horizontal. With this information I want to calculate first how long does it take the ball to go from launch to maximum height. Second, I want to know how high maximum height is above the level ground. And then third, and finally, I want to figure out how far the ball travels horizontally in the time between launch and when it reaches maximum height. Before working on this problem, I want to say what I mean by idealized projectile motion problem. What I mean is that we're going to ignore air resistance. We're going to ignore air resistance because air resistance makes a complicated contribution to the acceleration of an object going through the air. The acceleration due to air resistance is greater the faster the object is moving and the acceleration due to air resistance always opposes the object's direction of motion. So as this object goes through this non-constant direction trajectory and slowing down on the way up and speeding up on the way down, the acceleration due to air resistance is varying, it's non-constant, in a complicated way. So in order to actually do the calculation, we're going to ignore air resistance. Ignoring air resistance leaves us only with gravity, which is relatively simple. The acceleration due to gravity near the surface of the Earth is straight downward and has a constant magnitude of 9.8 meters per second per second. Speaking of constant acceleration, I've written here the component equations of motion for the case of a constant acceleration component. In particular, I've written them out for a constant a sub y. I could also write them out for a constant a sub x by taking every single y in here and changing it to an x. In fact, let me do that and I'll rewrite them over here. So does it make a difference to ignore air resistance? Well, if your friend's just a few meters away and you're tossing a softball or a baseball back and forth, it hardly makes any difference at all. On the other hand, if you're trying to calculate how far a home run ball is going to go based on the velocity of the ball as it leaves the bat, ignoring air resistance makes a big difference. If you ignore air resistance, you will substantially overestimate how far the ball is going to go. This problem is somewhat intermediate. It's a lot closer to soft toss than a home run ball, so the approximation won't be too awful if we ignore air resistance. Before we start on the problem proper, there's a few preliminaries we need to take care of. We need to identify a coordinate system, and then we need to figure out the components of the acceleration in that coordinate system. All right, so the acceleration in this problem is the acceleration due to gravity. It has magnitude 9.8 meters per second per second and a direction straight down. So I should align one of my coordinate axes with that acceleration, either align or anti-align. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my y direction to be directly up, and I'm going to take my x direction to be horizontal in the plane of the motion of the ball. All right, so I should write that coordinate system down right here. I'm going to write it right here. Now that I've chosen a coordinate system, I can write the x and y components of the given physical acceleration. 9.8 meters per second per second directly downward. There's none of that in the x direction, and it's entirely in the negative y direction, so the y component of the acceleration is negative 9.80 meters per second per second. Great. And while we're at it, we should also break up this initial velocity of magnitude 15 meters per second and direction 50 degrees above the horizontal. Because, for example, for both the y equations and the x equations, what we need are velocity components in the y and x direction, respectively. This is both in y and x, so I need to break it up. So let's do that. Let's identify the x and y components. x and y, x would be about to here, so I can erase the rest of that. And my y component would be here. So I have an initial x component of the velocity and an initial y component of the velocity. The zero means initial or at time zero. We're going to imagine that this ball has been launched at time zero. We can imagine taking v sub y zero and putting it over here to form a right triangle. The magnitude of the initial velocity will form the hypotenuse of the right triangle, 
The y component of the initial velocity is the opposite side, the side opposite of the 50 degree angle. And the x component of the initial velocity is adjacent to the 50 degree angle. Adjacent goes with cosine. Opposite goes with sine. So I can write out the initial x component of the velocity as v sub x zero equals 15 meters per second cosine 50 degrees, which comes out to 9.64 meters per second. Meanwhile, the vertical component of the velocity will be 15 meters per second times the sine of 50 degrees, or 11.49 meters per second, keeping an extra figure for now because this is an intermediate result. All right, with this information, we're now ready to start the problem. I'm just going to erase this right here. Moving on to part A, we're asked to find the time it takes for the ball to get from the point of launch to maximum height. Height suggests looking at the y component because height is information relating to changes in the y coordinate. So that suggests that we should look at our y component equations. And in fact, that's what we need to do in order to solve part A. However, let's imagine we couldn't figure that out from the get-go and we're stuck. What do you do if you're stuck? Well, just pick a direction and start with it. So let's set y equal to heads. Let's set x equal to tails. Let's flip a coin. Coin comes up tails. All right, let's go over here. So we have our x component equations. Now, these are general x component equations. We have information relating to our x component. The x component of the acceleration is 0 because the Acceleration, remember, was 9.8 meters per second per second downward. That's all in the negative y direction, and our x component is horizontal. All right, so let's put that information in. x component of the acceleration is 0, 0, 0. So what does that tell us? This tells us that the x component of the velocity at any time is equal to the initial x component of the velocity. Well, that's what it means to have 0 acceleration. And this equation here is just basically the squared version of that. All right, so there's nothing really new there. What about this? Ah, this tells us that if we know the x component of the velocity initially, which we do, uh, then given any amount of time, we could figure out the displacement. Ah, OK, so if we had the answer to part A, finding the time to the maximum height, then we could use this to figure out how far the thing went horizontally during that time. So this will help us with part C, but it's not going to help us with part A. All right, so we hit a dead end, but we still found something useful. So let's go over to our vertical equations. And before we do that, I want to choose a 0 level for my y coordinate. I'm going to set y equals 0 at ground level. Let's put a little arrow there and say y equals 0. That means I'm going to measure my y coordinate from ground level upward. Now, I could have chosen it somewhere else. I could have set it right here, set it at the initial launch point, and measure all my y coordinates from the launch point. If I did that, ground level would be at negative 1.5 meters. But I'm going to set y equals 0 at ground level. It's my choice. It doesn't actually matter where you set it as long as you set it and then you're consistent through the problem. And there's even ways to do it without even setting a y coordinate at all. For example, if, if you subtract y sub 0 from both sides, then you get y minus y sub 0. That's delta y. You could work in terms of delta y's. I'm going to work with this equation instead. OK, so looking at this equation, this tells me that the y coordinate at time t is equal to the initial value of the y coordinate. Well, my initial value, I'm setting my time equal to 0 at launch. So y sub 0 would be this 1.5 meters. My v sub y 0, that's the y component of the velocity at the initial time. That's this. I know my y component of the acceleration. That's that. Um, but I've got two unknowns, it looks like. I don't know the y coordinate at maximum height, and I don't know the time it takes to get from here to maximum height. If I knew one or the other, I could solve for the other one. All right. So if I knew the time to maximum height, I could then use this equation and solve for the y coordinate at maximum height. So I still need to find the time to maximum height. So let's go down to here. And I'm going to take this one, I'm going to put it up here so we can work with it. This equation says the y component of the velocity at time t is equal to the y component of the velocity at time 0 plus the y component of the acceleration times the time. All right, 
So we know the y component of the velocity at time zero. That's this. I'll plug that in a moment. I know the y component of the acceleration. That's this. I want the time it takes for the ball to get from the initial instant launch to maximum height. So this is what I'm looking for. The question is, do I know the y component of the velocity at this time, which is the time to reach maximum height? And the answer is yes. The y component of the velocity is the vertical component of the velocity. And at maximum height, the vertical component of the velocity has to be 0. Now, the horizontal component of the velocity doesn't change. The velocity of this ball is not 0 at maximum height, because there's still a horizontal component of the velocity. But the vertical component of the velocity is 0. So just to illustrate that, right before the ball reaches maximum height, the vertical component, the y component of the velocity, is still upward. But as after it reaches maximum height, the vertical component of the velocity is downward. Right at the top, it's transitioning from being upward to downward velocity, or positive to negative velocity. Transitioning from positive to negative means you're at 0. So for an instant, at maximum height, the y component of the velocity is 0. All right, so let's plug all those things in. y component of the velocity at time t is 0, because time t is maximum height. V sub y is 0 is 11.49 meters per second. A sub y is negative 9.80 meters per second per second times time. We can take this to the other side, subtract it from both sides, and divide by this and get the time. I'll write that out here. So we get t equals 1.173 seconds. I'll keep this extra figure for intermediate calculation. So if we want to round it for the final answer, 1.17 seconds. All right, so I'll put those right here. All right. Now that we have the time to maximum height, we can plug that into here to get the maximum height. So let me take this equation, put it up here. The y-coordinate at time t will equal the initial y-coordinate, which is 1.5 meters plus v sub y 0, 1.49 meters per second, times the time plus half the acceleration in the y direction, negative 9.80 meters per second per second times time squared. If we plug in the time corresponding to when the ball is at maximum height, we will get the y coordinate corresponding to maximum height. So we'll take this unrounded value of the time and plug it in for the time here. So I'm going to write all that right out and put it here. And if we plug all of this in our calculator, we get y equals 8.24 meters. So we need to interpret this answer. Taken literally, this answer says that the y coordinate is equal to 8.24 meters at the time 1.173 seconds, which was when the ball was at maximum height. So how does our y coordinate relate to the ground? Well, we took y equals 0 to be our ground level. So our y coordinate is measured from the ground. So the y coordinate at that time, which is the time for maximum height, does in fact give us the maximum height as measured from the ground. So the maximum height above the ground is in fact 8.24 meters, and I can put that in right here. If instead we had taken the initial launch location of the ball as our y equals zero level, then all our y values would have me been measured up from there, and we would have been measured, we would have gotten this amount for our y coordinate at the time 1.173 seconds, which actually would amount to this part of what we wrote in our equation. Then to get the maximum height above the ground, we'd have to take that amount, this amount, and add the 1.5 meters to it to get the total height above the ground of 8.24 meters. Now, with the time to maximum height in hand, we can also attack part C by looking at this here. So. If we want to figure out how far the ball has gone horizontally in the amount of time it took the ball to get from launch to maximum height, then we take that time, which we calculated here, plug it in, along with the initial x component of the velocity, and that will give us this change in horizontal position, this horizontal travel in that amount of time. So let's take those things, plug them in, put them here, and that gives us 11.3 meters. That's how far the ball travels horizontally between launch and between reaching maximum height. So that's this right here. So we can take that and plug it in here. And we've solved our problem.
I'd like to show you another way how to calculate the maximum height above the ground reached by the projectile without first finding the time to maximum height. That involves using this last equation that has the squares of the y components of the velocity. So let's take this equation, rewrite it right here. So delta y is what's going to interest us here. Delta y is the change in y. It's y minus y sub 0. Here's y sub 0. Here's y. And so the change in y, that's what we'd be calculating. So if we could calculate that change in y, delta y, then we could add 1.5 meters to it, and we would have the maximum height that the projectile reaches as measured from the ground. All right, so let's see if we can get this delta y. Well, we know a sub y, that's minus 9.8 meters per second per second. We know v sub y zero, the y component of the velocity at time zero, that's 11.49 meters per second, and we know v sub y. That's the y component of the velocity corresponding to y, which we've now identified as being at maximum height. So v sub y is zero. v sub y zero is 11.49 meters per second. We know the acceleration. Let's plug all those things in and put it right here. So we can subtract this from both sides, then divide both sides by this. We'll be left with delta y. I'll put the answer right here. We get 6.74 meters for delta y, so that's this. That's the change in y from launch to maximum height. If we take that 6.74 meters and add 1.50 meters, we'll get 8.24 meters in agreement with our earlier result. I'd like to make three closing points, which are all interrelated. The first point, in simple terms, is this. Keep the y stuff with the y stuff and the x stuff with the x stuff. Don't plug a y component of acceleration or a y component of initial velocity into an x component equation and vice versa. Now, I frame that as a negative, I frame that as a don't, but I want to put a positive spin on that, and that brings us to our second point. The second point is this. Idealized projectile problems can be broken up generally into largely independent vertical problems and horizontal problems. For example, this was a vertical problem to find the time to maximum height. This was a vertical problem to find the maximum height above the ground. But then we hopped down over here and we had a horizontal problem to figure out how far the object went horizontally during its time of flight from launch to maximum height. I said largely independent rather than completely independent because the vertical and horizontal subproblems are joined by a common parameter, the time. And the time it takes the projectile to go from launch point to its maximum height, it's traveling this much vertically, and it's traveling this much horizontally. And it does those things at the same time. So when it comes to solving the subproblems, that can be done largely independently. But those subproblems are linked by time, the common parameter. Being aware that these sorts of problems can be subdivided into vertical and horizontal problems can give you a real problem-solving advantage. And that brings me to my third and final point. Maybe you're working on one of these projectile motion problems and you just can't figure out where to start. What do you do? I suggest you just pick a direction and go with it and see what comes out. So near the beginning of this problem, when we were looking for the time to maximum height, I knew we needed to work with the y component equations, but we started with the x component equations. Two of those equations basically told us something that we already knew. The third equation, we ended up with two unknowns in a single equation, and so at the time it was a dead end. But then once we had found the time to maximum height, we came back to that equation later because that equation allowed us to figure out how far the ball traveled horizontally from the time it was launched till the time it reached maximum height. So a dead end for one part of the problem may be something useful for another part of the problem. All right, that's all for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.